Shall we start now? Can we start the live stream? Yes. I can be begin in uh, five seconds or so. Yes. Are we live? I can start. Yes. Let me know. Yes, we are. Okay. Live. Okay, great. So let's start. Um, thank you all for coming here today, either in a physical or a virtual presence. The symposium takes place in a hybrid uh, format here at NYU Shanghai, and it is also streamed live in the Digital Futures platform on YouTube. I'm Stavros Didakis, an associate professor in interactive media arts at New York University, NYU Shanghai. I am hosting this symposium as part of my exhibition, Synthetic Cities, which uh, takes place in Shanghai at the Riverside Project Space, hosted by Tank Shanghai and the West Bund uh, Group from August 24 until September 24, 2023. The main topic of our symposium focuses on human-machine creativity, which is uh, by no means a new topic. I can remember even when I was uh, writing my bachelor thesis on artificial intelligence for the creation of original media content almost 20 years ago. Um, but in the past few years, we have seen an emergence of platforms and systems that uh, allow everyone to work with AI technologies and we see a disruption in the way that we produce content in any industry or application. The primary focus of the event is to engage in a discussion concerning the collaborative dynamics between human imagination and computational intelligence. A central theme will revolve around how these two forces synergize to jointly create and contribute to the realms of creativity and originality. But before we begin, I would like to give my gratitude to the speakers and panel chair who have joined us here today. Your contribution means a lot to me and I cannot thank you enough. The symposium's itinerary includes a 20 minute presentation from each one of the four speakers who will share their research and insights. In addition to this, a designated panel chair will moderate a conversation for an in-depth discussion on human and machine creativity. At this point, please let me introduce our speakers. Niall Leach is an architect and theorist, a professor at Florida International University, the European Graduate School, and Tongji University. He is an author of over 40 books on architectural theory and digital design, with the most recent ones being Architectural Intelligence, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, an Introduction to AI for Architecture, and Machine Hallucinations, Architecture and Artificial Intelligence. Niall is also a co-founder of Digital Futures and a recipient of two NASA research fellowships. Daniel Bolojan is a computational design specialist, an architect, a professor, and the founder of Non-Standard Studio. His work focuses on generative design, multi-agent systems, and machine learning, and deals with applications of complex systems in architectural design, with a particular focus on how AI can be used creatively from a design and architectural standpoint. Chen Chufan is an award-winning Chinese speculative fiction author, translator, creative producer, and curator. He is vice president of Chinese Writers Association Science Fiction Committee, research scholar for Macmillan Center of Yale University, cultural leader of World Economic Forum, and has a seat on the X Prize Foundation Science Fiction Advisory Council. His work include the debut novel, Waste Tide, as well as AI 2041, 10 Visions of Our Future, co-authored with Dr. Kai Fu Li. 
And our panel chair, Anna Greenspan, a professor of global contemporary media at NYU Shanghai, with her research focusing on urban futures and emerging media. Anna is co-director of NYU Shanghai's new center for AI and culture, and is the co-editor along with Benjamin Bratton and Bogna Conyer of the book Machine Decision is Not Final, China and the History and Future of Artificial Intelligence. Anna's book, Shanghai Future, Modernity Remade, um, it was published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2014, and her latest monograph is China and the Wireless Undertow, Media as Wave Philosophy, which will be published in fall 2023. I look forward to hearing your insightful thoughts, practice, and critique. Thank you. Okay, so, um, I will start now my presentation that uh, focuses on an overview and analysis of my exhibition, Synthetic Cities. Synthetic Cities is an exhibition that centers on modes of human-machine co-authorship that question and explore creativity and originality. The six original works focus extensively on analyzing and implementing co-authorship models that recognize both the importance of AI efficiency and human criticality. The city, in this instance, is used as a constrainer and a probe, an examination artifact that assists in building symbolic representations that reflect on the human condition. It serves as a focal point for the construction of narratives that strive to capture originality and aim to contribute to the discourse on how we create, understand, and engage with a co-authored artistic content. The whole project started as a personal exploration with various machine learning and AI software and models, such as text-to-image generators and large language models. My goal during these first experiments was to generate content that displays originality or at least incorporates certain distinguished features. Through my experimentations over the last 12 or so months, I created six works that approach the topic of creativity through multiple lenses. The first display work is a print that encapsulates in a diagrammatic style my observations during the development of this exhibition regarding co-authorship methodologies for the creation of visual and textual content. Analyzing this from top to bottom, we find in the first instance the human creator who undergoes a search within an available space of possibilities to identify how machine processes can be utilized for content creation. During the heuristics and pieces phase, I made use uh, of a range of processes such as sketching, either physical or digital, developed scripts for bulk processing, use randomization for prompts, combine multiple media threads and so on, to form instructions that fit into the systems in order to generate the required content. By utilizing the technological apparatus at hand, synthesis models, software platforms, configuration settings and available data sets, I aim to generate artifacts that follow specific conceptual, aesthetic and technical characteristics. The initial outputs most of the times were reiterated through this process, calibrated and fine-tuned in an attempt to pass thresholds of commonalities and establish content that closely matches the set criteria, which are often in a state of flux as by the time of examination, multiple variables may have shifted. If the content passes the evaluation control, it enters the post-processing phase that consists of both manual and automatic processes for filtering, retouching, coherence checks, editing, optimization, and other additional enhancements so that it reaches a production-ready state. Through a process of holistic curation, ensuring that the content aligns with other selected outputs, it is tailored to fit the intended platforms that span multiple spaces, times, media, and scales. Uh, 
Besides the documentation value this diagram has for my own work, it can also serve as a depiction of the complexity of the generative development process, which is not just an input to a black box, but rather a much more elaborate and methodological process. The Synthetic Realm is the second work included in the exhibition and it consists of an LED screen, uh, four meters by 1.2 meters, and a computer vision analysis system. The work references the invention of the term panorama as an art form by the painter Robert Barker in 1787. Barker created a series of cityscape paintings with the intention of immersing the audience in images that appear to be a closer presentation of reality and in a sense provide an experience of realism accompanied by an engagement by the audience's intellect. The Synthetic Realm is an interactive work that displays fluid renditions of machine-generated and ever-changing cityscapes that start to continuously blend and evolve when a human comes in close proximity to the work. A computer vision analysis system awaits to sense a human present, and when this happens, it begins to ceaselessly dissolve multiple layers of endless panoramas in a continuous cycle. The synthetic images have been composed in such a way as to offer views of diverse urban landscapes that collide and collectively evolve. The installation inspires to deepen the viewer's engagement with the artificial medium, constructing a link between our recognized reality and the transient virtual cosmos. The work considers the possibility of formalizing an interaction to image language that assists us in expanding the creation possibilities in such a way that generative AI understands and is able to respond to much larger inputs, similar to the ones we, humans, employ on our day-to-day -day interactions. By enhancing the sensorial datasets of generative systems, we manage to witness a process that alters present norms, expanding into a multitude of possibilities for enhanced creation processes that recontextualize our worldview understanding. Neural Cityscapes is a media installation that offers the audience an audiovisual journey into animated city snapshots that have been produced with artificial means. Eight media screens arranged on custom-built architectural pillars serve as portals to a series of video compositions that reveal a mosaic of fictional landscapes meticulously woven together using custom-built software. The work is accompanied by a sound layer designed by the Shanghai-based uh, duo Frankfurt Helmet, and it attempts to enhance the visual narratives with a mesmerizing electric ambience. Through the lenses of the machine, we submerge into a pool of generative spaces that, despite their artificial origins, their existence becomes real. As it has been discussed in the past by media theorists such as Jean Baudrillard, Marshall McLuhan, and Willem Flusser, the hyperreality the medium constructs defines our behavior, experience, and memories. The understanding of our surrounding world is now being shaped by synthetic aesthetics that twist and alter our perception. In a similar manner, these animations depict architectural structures to transform continuously into fluid states. Our surrounding spaces, architectures, and cities are now being challenged through the infinite formations that Latin spaces produce. The new imageries now reside within the observer's mind and seamlessly meld into our collective imagination. Italo Calvino's novel, Invisible Cities, published in 1972, serves as a direct source of inspiration for this next work. Calvino, in his novel, places a fictitious Marco Polo in a dialogue with Emperor Kublai Khan, and in this exchange, Marco Polo recounts the cities he has visited during his travels across Asia. The cities, however, are not real, they do not appear on maps, and there is no proof that they have ever existed. They are only a reflection of Marco Polo's vivid imagination. 
So influenced by Calvino's work, Urban Echoes comes into a discussion with the audience and narrates cities that have been generated within the fluid consciousness of humans and machines. Herein, the viewer will find on the display system hundreds of co-authored cities, with each one presenting a unique narrative. The constraints for the development process of this piece were to identify a specific context, the city, to utilize a prose format for the text, and to ensure that each one of the outputs diverges as much as possible from the other ones. At the same time, it was important to ensure a high level of coherency in the final image and text compositions. The narratives aim not to focus on the description of the structural and physical characteristics of the cities, but to expand on symbolic and emotional representations that request subjective interpretations and provoke personalized meanings as they operate within social, cultural, and individualistic perceptual constructs. Here, I suggest to the audience not to question who the author is, either human or machine, but to review the content as is, without assumptions and preconceptions. The work is presented in six independent stations, with each one consisting of an LCD display with accompanying headphones and a navigation controller. Each generated CD is presented as visual imagery accompanied by a textual description that is sonified with the use of a machine-generated voice. The audience may use the interaction controller to navigate the virtual space and explore the hundreds of cities that have been included in this current uh, version. And in addition to this, the work contains one additional feature that it tends to provide further insights regarding the produced content. A collection of metacognitive AI systems have been designed and applied to provide quantitative and qualitative information on the associated city narratives. The first layer analyzes multiple properties of each narrative, such as the number of sentences, number of unique words, lexical diversity, narrative structures, figurative language, and a few more, as you may see on the image here. And uh, the second layer uses a different set of analysis models to provide qualitative feedback on the image composition of the associated city. These analysis methods give us much further insight, not only into how we should understand the piece, but also provide us with important information regarding how the machine processes are able to measure and understand creativity. The computational medium does not only exist here as a co-author, but also as a scholar and an art critic. Prompting and prompt engineering are terms associated with the way a specific request is given to a text-to-image synthesis model. The system's algorithms analyze the given prompt using natural language processing, extracting specific keywords and features that are then mapped to indexes within the datasets that the system has been trained on. During this process, the machine establishes necessary associations and draws conclusions that align with the user's prompt. Human input is necessary for the system. In complete prompts, limited datasets or systems with weak adversarial control significantly diminish the likelihood of generating coherent outcomes. Co-author traversals highlights this symbiotic relationship between humans and computational systems and presents an apparatus of media that poetically references this convoluted multidimensional ecology. Utilizing a data scraping algorithm, millions of prompts used for text to image generation were extracted from online databases and categorized into a custom data set of a thousand words. The dataset has been mapped on a series of three-dimensional rotating spheres, and with the use of a touchscreen interface, the audience is able to trigger specific keywords. Uh, 
The intersected words transition into a fluid state and are subsequently transformed into colored pixels highlighting in a visual metaphor the computational processes for image synthesis systems. The vertical screen continuously visualizes the content as frames that blend and evolve. Without a user input, the visual composition will transform into a static black and white image that resembles a calligraphy painting. The work attempts to depict the mutualistic symbiosis between biological and computational agents. The actions of every system and processes are equally essential to maintain a functional ecosystem. Computational machines are important to us as we humans are to them. Now, um, what is human creativity? What is machine creativity? How can we best describe these terms? This work answers these questions by utilizing a series of human-machine collaboration modes to produce multiples of thousands of original definitions of human and machine creativity. It has already been demonstrated that AI systems possess a remarkable capacity to discover new patterns and relationships within complex tasks far better than humans. If provided with a large data set, an AI system can scan an entire field of possible combinations and return outputs that can be considered novel or even ingenious. In the case of identifying patterns within a data set, artificial intelligence excels. However, in the case where the machine needs to expand the boundaries of its knowledge base and ex extrapolate from the outset of the training data set, its performance is challenged. To achieve thousands of original definitions in a specific context, as in this work, it is important to consider the data set patterns that a computational system can use, combined with the extrapolative quality of a human. This collaboration possesses a much larger capacity to produce outputs that hint at creativity and originality. The audience here is confronted with the juxtapositions and parallels within the dichotomy of human and machine creativity. Fundamentally disrupted the field of art, leading artists to move away from realism and towards more abstract and conceptual forms of expression, emphasizing the subjective nature of art or commenting on political structures and social dynamics. As with every new technology, AI systems are shaping new forms and relationships within our world. They have already become an integral part of creative, technical, and scientific production, fostering cutting-edge practices that introduce new concepts, pose critical challenges, and even spawn new art genres. AI systems will continue to assist us in generating original and stimulating content. But even more than that, they will help us to form a better understanding of art and an even better understanding of the human experience. In 1967, Italo Calvino delivered the lecture Cybernetics and Ghosts, where he raised the question of whether a computer will ever be able to replace a human poet. He asked if a computer could possibly establish interplays of linguistic signs, literary conventions, anthropological constants, social roles, and technical media from which literary texts always emerge throughout history. In one passage, he states, nothing prevents us from foreseeing a literature machine that at a certain point feels unsatisfied with its own traditionalism and starts to propose new ways of writing, turning its own codes completely upside down. Calvino named this autonomous system a logical fantastic machine, which has to serve a real and essential need, the need to enlarge the sphere of what we can imagine. 
This aligns with the purpose of my work, which seeks to illuminate on the potentialities where AI doesn't replace, but rather enhances human creativity. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, and I will hand it over to Niall. Hi, Stavros. Um, Thank you. Good to be here. Um, let me share my screen. We start then with a, a monolith, a monolith that was generated by Midjourney version 5.2, that serves to introduce uh, the first topic they want to address, um, the theme of the monolith in the movie 2001, uh, A Space Odyssey, that was uh, written by Stanley Kubrick in association with Arthur C. Clarke. We are all familiar, I think, with the, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. It was, um, it is, for many people, it was the, um, uh, it's been voted the, the most popular movie of all time. And it has in the very beginning, a very curious episode when these monoliths appear um, on the landscape. These, according to the book by Arthur C. Clarke, um, the 2001 Space Odyssey, these monoliths are, uh, are generated by the, um, the firstborn. This is the, um, the first species of superintelligent life who install these uh, machines. Let's call them um, uh, communication devices in various places around the universe, including on the Earth itself, as a way of kind of being a catalyst to developing certain tools. And as we know from the particular movie, this is the moment when our ancient ancestors start discovering the use of the tool itself. In some sense, this relates to AI itself because AI could possibly be the final tool, the final tool that we only have to invent. Once AI starts inventing, reinventing, gets up inventing other reforms of AI, that, according to some commentators, is the last invention human beings will have to make. What is interesting about the first one is that they uh, they started off with, with corporeal form and then they dematerialized uh, and uh, they they. Um, uploaded their consciousness into computers, so that computers themselves became conscious. That itself is very relevant to what we're talking about these days because we're seeing the potential for computers themselves to do the same. And also the form of dematerialization of not having any physical form relates very closely to AI. AI, after all, is based on algorithms. They're very sophisticated algorithms, but they're algorithms nonetheless. As such, they are effectively invisible. And we are surrounded by AI all the time, even though we don't realize it. On our personal devices, our personal monoliths, if you like, we, are, we, are, we have a whole host of different AI applications. AI is what's filled with our spam uh, in, on, on email. It's what finishes our sentences on Gmail. It's what recognizes our friends on Facebook. It what, it's what allows us to order an Uber and so on and so on. We are absolutely totally surrounded by AI, but many are not aware of it because AI itself is invisible. This is a comment that I made in my book. It is as though the earth has been invaded by an invisible, super intelligent alien species. I want to play you now um, a, a short comment by Arthur C. Clarke, um, who was, of course, as he was involved in 2001 Space Odyssey. This is from 1964, and it is astonishing how he predicts the situation in which we now find ourselves. However, the most intelligent inhabitants of that future world won't be men or monkeys. They'll be machines, the remote descendants of today's computers. Now, the present-day electronic brains are complete morons, but this will not be true in another generation. They will start to think, and eventually they will 
completely outthink their makers. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end, and we're now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be thousands of times swifter. That comment of thousands of times shift, uh, swif uh, swifter kind of relates also to the situation in which we find ourselves now with ChatGPT. ChatGPT, we are told, knows 10,000 times more than any one individual. And its a launch into November last year created a, a shockwave throughout the world. And my point would be that not even those working in AI predicted how successful it would be, or indeed how predicted how successful diffusion models such as uh, mid-journey would be. The point being that they proved to be so capable that those involved in the whole industry have become alarmed at their capabilities, what has been called their emergent capabilities. These are things that I will talk about in a moment, but they are the things that allow for the creativity of ChatGPT to be able to compose a sentence, and I want to argue is what allows them to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to generate designs on mid-journey. So we're all familiar with the kind of the events that have been happening um, uh, in the press recently, the letter that was signed by Elon Musk and others calling for a halt to AI research. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, um, the godfather of AI, uh, warning us about the dangers of it, uh, and, and, uh, and, and others too, also concerned about this. AI has, in some senses, proved to be so successful that it's proved to be disturbing. To my mind, AI is not evil. If there is a, a dark side of AI, it is its, uh, its very capabilities. And these go down to something that, that has been, I think, overlooked by many architects, the term large language models. These are actually a, a complete understatements. These are pre-trained natural, natural language processing models that are trained on an absolutely enormous quantity of, of data and with an enormous quantity of parameters. And it is their size rather than any technological innovation, because frankly, they only have about 2,000 words of lines of code that makes them so astonishing. This then led then to, the, to the, the, the letter from the Future of Life Institute um, calling for a halt in the development, especially um, of any system more powerful than ChatGPT. And essentially, we've got the moment OpenAI and Google uh, have been the leaders in the field producing these large language models. What I find interesting, though, is a reference at the very bottom of the page to a term emergent capabilities, which I find a, an astonishing term in itself. I, I'll just maybe read a few sentences from this. Therefore, we call on all AI, AI, AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. This pause should be, be public and verifiable and include all the actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted uh, quickly, government should step in and institute uh, a moratorium. Let me just skip the final sentence here. This document does not mean a pause on AI development in general, merely a stepping back from the dangerous race to ever larger, unpredictable black box models with emergent capabilities. So what does that term emergent capabilities mean? In short, it is the capabilities that have allowed AI to, to write sentences, to translate different languages, to write code, and I want to claim also to design. The term emergence is familiar enough. John Holland was possibly the most uh, first person, prominent person to write about it. Um, and more recently, Stephen Johnson has written a popular book, came out in 2002, actually the day of 9-11, um, that actually connects everything to uh, to cities themselves, so the connected lives of ants, uh, um, of uh, effective lives of ants, brains, cities, and softwares. But it is this term emergence that I want to interrogate because that's this is the fascinating aspect to my mind of what is happening. We've all seen these kind of phenomena in nature, a kind of biological intelligence, a kind of swarm intelligence. This is the this is a the murmuration um, of starlings in Brighton in the UK where I used to be a professor that happens every evening uh, throughout the winter 
an astonishing aerial acrobatics that is a perfect demonstration of the logic of emergence. All the birds are actually doing is following a set of very straightforward instructions. Broadly, keep pace with the bird in front and, and keep a certain distance from those around and go in the, roughly the same direction. But out of that, out of that collective behavior, something astonishing emerges in an, in a bottom-up way, and that is to say, emergence itself. Now, what is interesting about this term is the larger the multi system, the more the manifestation of emergence, to the point that when we get strong emergence, we get manifestations of what appears to be magic. Of course, magic doesn't exist. In the words of, of, attributed to Arthur C. Clarke, magic is simply something that science cannot explain just yet. And that is the interesting aspect of emergence. From John Holland onwards, no one has so far has been able to, to explain emerge in scientific terms. We can see it, we can describe it, but it cannot be um, explained in any sort of way. And this is what I would say is the key question, the drive behind creativity itself in AI systems. Let me turn move to uh, Jeffrey Hinton, another Brit. Um, and actually, curiously, and many people don't know this, Jeffrey Hinton trained for two days as an, as an architect at the University of Cambridge before he shifted to another discipline. He clearly realized that architecture was not for him. Hinton is the great hero of neural networks, of deep learning. Um, he, uh, uh, he, he is a great, great grandson of George Boole of Boolean geometry fame. And he remained convinced in, in his career that the secret to AI was through understanding how the brain worked. And he was obsessed with neural networks, even during a period when neural networks were out of favor. Eventually, once GPUs were invented and once computers became much more powerful and much more um, uh, 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 much quicker, suddenly neural networks began to work. So he is the hero, the godfather, as it were, of not only deep learning, but also to some extent, AI itself. Now, let me just play to him, play you a section of why he is concerned about the very tools that he developed and how they proved to be far more capable than he ever imagined and why they're ahead of their time, much before, more he, before he predicted, they're causing consternation. So this is Jeffrey Hinton. It made me realize that these digital intelligences have something we don't have that makes them much better. When one of them knows something, it can tell all the others, that's what we don't have with people. So imagine you had 10,000 people, and imagine if when one person learned something, everybody knew it. You could learn a lot more stuff, right? right. And that's why things like ChatGPT knows like 10,000 times as much as any one person. It's because when you train it, there's lots of different copies looking at different bits of the data and learning stuff, and they can all combine what they learn instantly with a bandwidth of like trillions of bits. So can they think? Yes. So imagine the following scenario. I'm talking to Chatbot, and we talk for a bit, and the answers it's given me seem a bit strange to me, and I suddenly realize that it thinks I'm a teenage girl. And I say, what demographic do you think I am? And it says it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Um, so the question is, when I said it's I suddenly realize it thinks I'm a teenage girl. Was that a metaphorical use of the word think? Or was that just the same way as we use think? And I strongly believe that use of the word think, when I said it thinks I'm a teenage girl, was exactly the same way of using think as we do with people. And so that was enough to make you say, what, this has accelerated beyond my comfort level? I suddenly realized maybe they already are better, and making them more like real neural nets isn't the point. They're already better than us. They're a better way of doing learning. And if we make them bigger, they'll get much smarter than us. They already know more than any one person. I, I understand that things could go awry, but I still think that people hear the notion of danger and they dismiss it as hyperbole. I thought it was hyperbole for a long time because I thought these things were a long way off. I thought there will eventually be danger, but I thought, um, focusing on it now is unnecessary because it'll be 30 to 50 years before these things get more intelligent than us. But this combination of realizing that they might have a much better way of learning than we have, because they can share knowledge instantly, and seeing things like ChatGPT or Palm at Google, 
that can explain why a joke is funny made me realize these things are already pretty intelligent and if they've got a better form of intelligence than ours then it gets to be much more urgent. Just to clarify, up until now, we've assumed that AI cannot think. It has no more capacity to think than your pocket calculator, pocket calculator does. But what we're discovering is there are certain forms of behavior that are approximating to human thinking. I'm not sure I would say it's the same as human thinking, but certainly very similar if we put the word think in inverted commas. The other comment I'd make is that uh, Jeffrey Hinton's comment about uh, the joke, what happened was he asked Palm to explain a joke. Now, if Palm can explain a joke, it can understand a joke. So therefore we have the word thinking, we have the word un understanding, and we also have the word intelligence. Now, Hinton believes that these digital intelligences are, have a different form of intelligence to us, but nonetheless, a far superior form of intelligence. And I would second that. I think we have to refer to it, therefore, as a form of alien intelligence. And the mistake that we've been making is to assume that we are the center of everything and we should be judging AI according to our standards. So far, we've been criticizing AI because it's not conscious, it's not sentient, it doesn't think, and so on. What I'm, going to, what I'm suggesting in my writing is that we need to go through a second Copernican revolution, just as Nicholas Copernicus had pointed out that actually the universe doesn't revolve around the Earth, but the Earth revolves around, around the sun. So too, we have to realize that we are not the center of intelligent life in the universe. Yuval Harari is alarmed by what these things are capable of doing. In his terms, they have hacked the operating system of human civilization. He's referring here primarily to language. Language is the key to everything. What I want to claim also, however, is that they hacked the visual system of, the, of, your, of human civilization, i.e. design, design itself. And what I want to show you here, just a few examples of mid-journey that prove my point. Here is a, um, a house, a, 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 in the prompt I describe it as being an ultra uh, contemporary minimalist house in the Austrian Alps. Now I put a lot of words, other words into the prop, describing the lighting conditions, the ultra hyper realism of the image and so on, but that is all I said. I didn't describe anything about the design of this structure, nor did I describe anything about the things around the structure, this, this the rock in the foreground, the bush in the background, the mountains in the background, the valley, I did not specify anything. Mid-journey generated all of that. And I, what I want to claim it is it, it designed all of that. Or take this kitchen. I, in the prompt, I simply said, uh, uh, ultra-modernist contemporary stainless steel kitchen. I made no reference to this painting in the background. It's actually quite a nice painting. I made no reference to the, the bush outside, to the coffee maker, to the tap, or any of these things. Mid-journey, did it all. And so it goes on. It's able to understand how tectonic materials go together in a very logical fashion. It's able to produce a form of hyper-realism that would take us months to do. And of course it does it in three seconds, just like ChatGPT gives us an answer in three seconds. And it's able to put in reflections, to render things, to produce lighting conditions that would take months and months and months for humans to do. This, to my mind, is a complete revolution in how we're generating things. It has proved itself to be far more successful. Mid-journey has just been through its first birthday, as it were, and yet it's, it, the, 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 the standard that it's reached is simply, truly astonishing. Now, what also interests me about these things, what also interests me about these things, is the logic of the prompt itself. Because what I've discovered, if I take the prompt, the words for this, for this prompt, and I simply exchange them to something else. So instead of saying house in the Austrian Alps, I would have put uh, um, uh, 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 jewelry uh, on a model. Um, uh, or, or, uh, uh, what would happen is I get this. This is absolutely the same prompt with that simple, uh, this simple change. Or this, earrings on a model, as opposed to house in the Austrian Alps. Or indeed this, uh, 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 a fashion item, a model wearing a fashion item as opposed to a house in the Austrian Alps. Or indeed, these astonishing um, 
uh, uh, these astonishing uh, handbags that were generated. I hate to say this, I did the whole of this, this the, the, these images of this particular reel in less than five minutes. It is absolutely amazing what's happening. People are actually asking me, where can I buy these handbags? What we're witnessing is nothing short of astonishing. It actually reminds me in some ways of the concept of Gesamtkunstwerk, the idea of the total work of art that was, that, was, uh, that was coined in the 18th century, but in fact refers back to the Baroque period where for, you would go from maybe the door handles to the interior decoration, to the, uh, to the, the, the building itself, to the urban planning, and also the music all fitting into the same logic. In some senses, that's what we've arrived at today. Absolutely, to my mind, astonishing. I, in 2009, I published this AD on digital cities. And what was interesting is that uh, the way that architects respond to it. Um, Patrick Schumacher, for example, is I need architects whose images on the front cover a project in Istanbul. Uh, and imagine the possibility that everything would be parametric. Well, what will the city of the future look like? Will it look something like this out of something like the Jetsons? Or will it look much the same as the cities of today? And this is Los Angeles where I am right now, but with a few uh, individual buildings put in the vacant lots that still exist, but with everything retrofitted with AI and other, other systems. I strongly believe that it's going to be not about form, but about informational systems. The city of tomorrow will be governed by informational systems. And a perfect example of this is the way in which we order an Uber. If you think about an Uber, is an Uber any different in terms of its form to other cars? No, because it is an ordinary car. It is exactly the same. But what's happening is that the, the way in which the information is being processed is radically different. And it seems to me, that is the logic of how our cities in the future are going to be operating. The informational systems that we use are going to be radically different. So I come now to Shanghai and I come also to the company called uh, City Brain, which is devising a logic in China for how you solve the problems. And it does, through, does so through a digital twin. It does so through a digital twin whereby by feeding real-time information uh, from the city and using AI, it's able to calculate the way to solve traffic problems, um, the way to get emergency vehicles to accidents much quicker and quicker than, than before. And it seems to be working. It's almost like we can see the city becoming intelligent, becoming a kind of brain city. And these are their words, cities that learn to think. Up until now, I thought that cities couldn't learn to think. But what would happen if we have this massive multi-agent system one of the largest cities on the planet, feeding in into the logic of a large language model, what would become of it? I want to speculate that there are various skill sets, or various abilities, uh, 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 various emerging capabilities that we don't know about yet, that these language log models that are operating. And let's not forget the city itself is an example of swarm intelligence. So we are getting a form of enhanced uh, intelligence in the city. But I want to speculate that there is something else that is going to happen. My suspicion, and I'm not even sure what term I should be using, is that through these large movements, through these sort of urban conditions, we are going to the point where AI is hacking not just our human operating system, not just our ability to design, but also understanding the meaning of life itself. The kind of the, the, the kind of genetics, the the uh, the, the genome of, of, of the human culture. And of course, we know this from before, from a previous model, also from a compatriot of mine, Douglas Adams, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where there was a supercomputer that was devised to give the answer to the, the to meaning of life, the universe and everything. And we all know the answer was 42, and they had to go back to the drawing board and come up with what was the question to the answer of the meaning of life. Now for Elon Musk, just briefly, for Elon Musk, this is a book about philosophy, because in order to get the right answer, you have to define the question properly. But the crucial difference between this supercomputer and the large language models that are behind ChatGPT is that it took 10 million years for deep thought to come up with this answer. ChatGPT does it in three seconds. And the answer, don't panic, don't panic. 
or maybe another British way of expressing things, keep calm and carry on. We are witnessing an astonishing moment in human civilization that is going to change absolutely everything. And it's, it can be compared to other inventions, the wheel, electricity, and so on. But the thing that makes it so different, at no point in civilization so far have we invented something that has been more intelligent than us. And that is why I'm referring to alien intelligence as something astonishing that we need to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. <laughs> Wonderful talk, as always. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, Daniel Bolojan to share the next uh, talk. Hi, Daniel. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All good. Amazing. So it's um, it's great to be here and to be part of uh, this uh, lineup of speakers. Um, I think we are going to have quite a wide range of opinions, which is always, I think, good. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, like I'm mostly working with AI for a few years now. And uh, in this presentation, I'll, I'm going to try to, to give also like uh, potential of AI, some shortcoming of AI, and also certain solutions that personally I'm uh, developing for uh, this kind of shortcomings. And over the years, just to give a bit of background, I have a background in complex, uh, complex systems, in agent-based modeling, and um, I've, I've developed quite a lot of tools uh, revolving this kind of idea of uh, swarm intelligence, stick merge, and so on. And since 2016, I started to be more interested into uh, creative AI. And um, two themes that are keep repeating in my research are this idea of encoding um, intelligence or articulation of of design process in which design intention and architectural intelligence are embedded uh, within emergent processes and also creative AI, which uh, deals with, uh, or it's exploring the potential of teaching machines to interpret, to perceive, to be creative. And just to give a bit of uh, background on my research or context actually in my research, um, uh, I'm approaching my research on creativity from, from a perspective of process-centric creativity. So uh, John Giro describes this kind of idea of artifact-centric creativity versus process-centric. And in my case, when I'm talking about creative AI, I'm talking about processes in a way that um, are, have the potential to produce something creative. So at this point, it's for sure crucial to make the distinction between human creativity and machine creativity. And if we remember uh, when computer scientists uh, first embarked in this uh, mission on, of teaching computers to see, they initially really thought that or they assumed that machines are going to see the world the same way that we humans do. And later they realized that computers recognize numbers. They do so by identifying patterns uh, of pixel relationships. So often uh, we find ourselves pondering these questions like, uh, can machine, a machine perceive the world in the same way that we do as humans? And I think uh, um, this question is not really that relevant. To put it in Alan Turing's words, uh, can a machine perform a task that can be described as saying, even, even if uh, it does so in a very vastly different way than the way that humans see? Um, and when we compare then human creativity to machine creativity, it's crucial to steer clear of applying this kind of very exclusive uh, human-centric kind of standard. Uh, and we should acknowledge that machines can demonstrate creativity in ways that are fundamentally different um, than uh, human creativity. Uh, so when it comes to this kind of idea of uh, creativity, like uh, over the years, there were many definitions of uh, what we understood through creativity. Initially, it was just a form of discovery, of imagination. Later, we, we started to understand creativity as uh, creative processes. And um, despite this kind of extensive scientific exploration of creativity, um, uh, we are still, in a way, it's very hard still to, to describe what creativity is in objective terms. So uh, one, uh, one renowned uh, researcher in cognitive science and uh, uh, creativity, Margaret Broden, she defines creativity, at least human creativity, as combinatorial, exploratory, and transformational. And uh, when it comes to machine creativity, uh, we have Demis Asabi, the creator of DeepMind, that ident identifies three types of machine creativity, uh, interpretive, extrapolative, and inventive. Now, 
neural networks are quite good at interpolation. They are these massive statistical machines and they excel at spotting uh, patterns in data and they average in a way things out, yeah? And as designers, sometimes we can also draw in a way uh, um, comparison and we say, well, we also as designer, we, we kind of uh, engage in an interpolative mode of creativity where we start to combine different uh, ideas that we, uh, we know previously and we just combine them and uh, by combining them, we interpolate and we generate something new. It's also important to know that neural networks, they really struggle when it comes to extrapolation. And what we mean by extrapolation, we mean that is the network able to generate something that is outside of the data set, outside of uh, what was presenting the data set. And there are very uh, few networks that are actually capable to do that. Yeah. Other uh, aspects that networks are not very good at are um, developing a deeper understanding of concepts, uh, enhancing abstract thinking cap capabilities, uh, cultivating the ability to reason by analogy, for example, or imagination, memory systems, and so on. Yeah? And it's worth, in a way, uh, uh, noting that all these systems that we are saying that right now they are not very good at these aspects, uh, they are isolated networks, uh, and often they are limited to um, uh, one modality, and they have no uh, interaction with uh, external stimuli. We hear a lot about this kind of idea of artistic creativity, but if we consider creativity in other domains, such as scientific creativity, which produces beautiful new theories in mathematics and physics, it's unclear to me, once you get into these kind of formal domains, to what extent what we call today creativity is nothing more than a form of meaningful random search, and basically structuring how we search for the right thing. And certain people, if you think about it, certain people have a talent to shape in which direction they are searching for new things. When you talk to digital composers, you'll notice that they begin with some random music string, which are then enhanced and manipulated until a melody emerges. It's almost as if they are shaping or warping or distorting somehow the search space, yeah? So can we use then AI to augment how we conduct this kind of meaningful random searches or design explorations. Now, although we engage with this kind of um, very sophisticated learning machines, another question arises, uh, are we as humans fully equipped to effectively evaluate the results given our inherent, uh, inherent um, limitations? So our judgments, for example, often reflect our uh, limitations and we may be, uh, we may remain unaware when we are trapped in familiar design patterns. For example, we are often unaware when we are trapped in a design local minima, which is a more suboptimal sub uh, solution. And this is not to say that the human role is not important in creative processes, but it, I think it's important to understand these limitations and perhaps understand, can we use perhaps machines to help us see in a way certain things that uh, by default we cannot see because everything we hear, see, read makes sense for us in the context of what we know. Uh, again, we have these massive AI models and we provide them with an enormous amount of data enabling, uh, enabling them to learn. And what is the primary goal then of using these models? Is it to interpolate past data or to create uh, derivatives? Uh, is the goal uh, to help us um, in creative problem solving. And if we look at this idea of uh, creative problem solving, John Giro again explains that humans are remarkable. They have a remarkable ability to extract key features from similar experiences and create broader concepts. Moreover, uh, even a single intense experience can significantly impact our learning. In the real, realm of design, for example, we make these generalizations after each experience, which then uh, can we shape our concepts? And for instance, uh, consider the observation that placing logs under a load makes it easy to move or easier to move. This insight can lead to generalization that uh, rotating elements like uh, wheels positioned underneath an object also is movement. So this generalization, generalized knowledge can then be applied to design tasks such as creating shopping carts or suitcases with uh, wheels or improved mobility. And if we push even uh, further in a way, this kind of idea, uh, we can conclude that reducing friction between two objects enhances their ability to glide smoothly. And then we see the kind of, this kind of concept of uh, hyperloop uh, transportation. Now, 
when we when we go to uh, neural networks um, to get to that kind of level of generalization, there are a few challenges yeah, with general, uh, with uh, neural networks, and this is going to collide a bit with with um, Neil's you know a, a presentation probably, because I think there are two camps right now in AI. So I'm more in the camp of uh, Jan Lecun, where he's uh, still impressed in a way by these kind of uh, models, but he sees them as uh, quite shallow. And if we are looking at the application of AI in architectural design, there's no doubt that creative problem solving is a very complex behavior. And the act of designing, it's one of the most complex humans' behaviors. Uh, so, uh, and why is that? Is because it needs to, to address several uh, problems such as representation in design, uh, design semantics, in inference in design, combinatorial exploration in design, indexing in design, generalization in design. So there are a lot of, a lot of concepts in a way that have to be covered. And an issue with this kind of AI model is that um, they are specific to, to certain modalities. And when they are applied in architectural design to tackle various tasks, they often oversimplify the intricate connections among architecture elements. And this becomes in a way problematic as architecture, ar architectural outcomes depend on the uh, interplay of multiple systems. So these discrete systems then, they can perform very impressive achievements such as image uh, synthesis, language synthesis, or domain transfers. However, just because they can do this thing doesn't mean that they understand what they are doing. For example, an AI model might be able to generate a realistic image of a building, but it doesn't know that the image is of a building or even more importantly, what the building is. And and similarly, an AI model might be able to give accurate predictions, but it doesn't understand why the prediction is accurate. And another uh, challenge lies in the fact that these models are monomodal. Uh, most of the models out there, they are trained on uh, one modality or uh, maximum two modalities, uh, which again, design is a multimodal endeavor. So it's very then uh, problematic in a way to, to apply uh, this kind of models to, to design. Yeah? Uh, again, Jan LeCun, who's the creator of, creator of uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, has described current neural networks as mirrors. Uh, they reflect the content of the data set, but lack a deep understanding. In essence, the, the, deep of, uh, the depth of understanding in these AI models is as shallow as that of a mirror. So according to him, uh, to uh, Jan LeCun, the issue does not stem from the inability of the AI model, but rather from the constrained na nature of the modality on which these networks are trained. Now, another idea that um, this kind of idea of uh, a thousand brain theory by Jeff Hawkins underscores the significance uh, of multimodality in learning and comprehending reality. According to Jeff Hawkins, our brain produces numerous models of each object using various uh, sensory inputs, visual, auditory, tactile, etc. And these models reach an agreement of what we experience or what they experience, leading to what we perceive as being the object. And in this sense you know why the brain works like thousands of brains yeah so personally i don't believe in this kind of future uh where uh, uh, uh future is going to be dominated by one single uh, uh powerful ai that's going to rule all the other ais but i'm more in a way inclined to believe that uh, as generative ai models become more and more ubiquitous it is becoming increasingly clear that the future will be will not be dominated by one single all powerful ai but the future will be shaped by a collection of discrete task specific and domain specific ai models that interact with one another and this is also shared by benjamin bratton and also blaze from google now just so highlight this, uh, since 2016 uh, on Hugging Face, which is an open source collaboration platform for the machine learning community, there are more than 230,000 open source AI models since 2016. And this is just one platform alone, yeah? So also like 40,000 uh, data sets and so on. And moreover, as observed by uh, Gary Gasparov in his book, Deep Thinking, where machine intelligence ends as human creativity begins, is not enough only to have a powerful machine. According to Kasparov, the limitation in current AI workflows can be overcome by adjusting the relationship between the human and the artificial element in the process. And he observed that a weak human player plus the machine plus a better process is superior to a very powerful machine alone and surprisingly superior to a strong human player plus machine and an inferior process. And these ideas in a way are put in practice then also through several projects, uh, three of which I'm going to try to showcase today. Uh, the first project is the Pionblau, which is a collaborative effort with Copionblau in Vienna, Austria. And the project in a way operates at the intersection of architecture practice and uh, deep learning. 
This project delves in the potential of teaching machines in collaborations with humans to foster creativity. It aims to enable uh, machines to interpret, perceive, propose new designs, enhance design processes, and augment design creativity. Um, the project uh, got a few awards for those of you that uh, don't know the, the, the office. I'm just showing you know, here like a few projects designed by, uh, by the office. And this project relies on multimodal data sets. Uh, which are accumulated over 50 plus years um, of practice uh, with more than um, 90 plus, uh, 900 plus or almost a thousand projects. And we are able to have like all these projects, multi, uh, we have each project different modalities. We have from images to 3D models to uh, descriptions of the project and so on. Yeah. And uh, this model, again, this kind of system, TP on Blau system, is developed as a node-based system that uh, that may automate partial parts of the process and thus streamline the overall workflow. And other nodes are there to help amplify the intelligence of the practice. And we sum up this into augmentation versus aut automation. Currently, the system has roughly 15 nodes. Um, and th there are some nodes that address uh, topics, environmental topics, other more technical, like organizational aspects, and other gestalt topics. Yeah. Some of the nodes again focus on surface rationalization and panel optimization, while other handle programmatic organization, organization, and real-time environment evaluation. Our designers, uh, this is the interesting part, the way that we are designing the system, our designers can interact with the node-based system by creating workflows that connect various nodes within the system that are tailored for the specific design task that they're working on. And here you just see a few examples of these nodes that uh, we, we develop. And the way uh, our office designer interact with the system and how the system uh, networks interact internally are crucial aspects for us. Besides facilitating connection between multiple nodes, the system also allows for more combinations, blending and exchange uh, or exchange of semantic levels between different nodes. This augments in a way the office workflow by enabling feedback loops across various design skills and interactions between machines and designers with, within a nonlinear open process framework. For us, it's really important this idea of how can we have the PM law system learn from the entire body of work of the practice. But at the same time, for us, it's also important to how we grow as designers. How can we grow together humans and the machine? So we are looking at different kinds of methods. So the previous one was uh, reinforcement learning through uh, human feedback. Uh, we also start to implement different uh, uh, methods of bringing away human feedback through federated learning. So here, uh, federated learning allows in a way to have uh, custom models trained on a local uh, user computer. And then uh, what's happening is that um, the, the models are trained locally and there is a pool that uh, gathers all, all the weights of the networks and then there's a consensus that's being created and the consensus is being sent up to the to the main network afterwards. So in this way, we really bring in, you know, like this kind of sensibilities of each of the designers that we have. Now, challenges with AI models that are uh, publicly available like um, uh, Midjourney, DALI and so on, they have a very, very strong preference towards specific styles in a way. And that's why my, my, uh, my uh, explanation why you can input a very primitive prompt in and get a very, very high quality image is because there is a sort of pre, uh, um, the, the model is fine tuning in a certain way that is going to give you only good images, yeah? But for us as an architecture practice, this is problematic because a lot of these models, they don't really describe correctly the, the uh, language that the office uh, engages with. So in this case, for example, uh, just a very simple prompt, a comparison, the three most available networks there, I mean, Journey, DALI and Stable Diffusion, and none of them describe correctly the, the uh, language of the office. Um, and here uh, on the bottom, you see in a way, uh, once we fine tune our own model, you see in a way the, the kind of aesthetics and language that um, that it's more particular to the office. And in order to do that, uh, what we ended up doing is this was a, a, a very large effort in the entire office. Each designer got a batch, a, sim, a small batch of uh, of the data set, and each designer had to create descriptions and to explain in a way certain ideas, certain concepts. And the hope there was that in this way, we can have a model that is able to understand the way that we in the office describe certain ideas and certain concepts, yeah, visually and also through text, yeah. 
And here are just a few examples of that. I'm going to try to go a bit fast just so that uh, I'm on time. And here another challenge is that we have in architecture is that this idea in mid journey, you cannot create different perspectives on the same object. So uh, our model is able to do that. Yeah, we are able to query for specific um, uh, side view, left view, top view of a, a specific uh, composition. And we are able to extract that, yeah. So it's we call this retaining compositional consistency. And we have different kinds of modalities. Again, this is these are modes that uh, um, we generate in order to have the designers interact in a way with our um, with our model, yeah. Another project that I wanted to show is this kind of project that explores the integration of uh, artificial intelligence in the design process by offering fresh perspectives of how AI can be or can reshape, let's say, the design process. And what you're looking at, this project investigates how elements from different design fields, including fashion, uh, furniture, sculpture, automotive design, can be incorporated into architecture project. Yeah? How exactly can we uh, extract certain features and then recompose or combine, develop our own like you know, a semantic uh, universe uh, that then we can use to, to train and to generate certain results. Yeah? So right now we, we have like multiple um, uh, domains, design domains that we were looking at. Uh, so this is a um, project did with students here at Florida Atlantic University School of Architecture. So in each domain, there are several steps that are followed, including curation of the data set, predicting text from images, semantic analysis, curating prompts, generating images, cross-examining semantics, and then training the models. And then the training, the models, uh, we encode features from all these kind of nine domains onto images of one of, of the projects uh, or the location where the project uh, was located. So in the end, we are trying to bring all these kind of ideas, semantics from different domains and create our own language in a way, our own universe. So here you just see a few of those results. And in the end, it's this kind of process of how you are searching away for the solution, like similar with the idea that I was mentioning at the beginning when it comes to creativity. What if creativity is just a, a strategic random search or something? And here you can see like how we start to also identify, uh, to start to extract like is, are the features properly represented? So we have different heat maps that we use to, to uh, analyze that. And the last project that I want to show is, for those of you that are familiar with my work, I have uh, long expressed this vision of a future characterized by heightened uh, creativity, where the flourishing of fine tuning and custom model generation ushers us in an era of creative um, uh, for uh, ushers us in a new era for the creative industries. And in this envisioned future, the dominance of a single all-powerful AI is replaced by billions of specialized AI models interacting harmoniously as a ecology of uh, self-organized entities. And creative individuals will have the ability then to construct their own universe, defining their unique syntax and language and fine-tune custom models to bring their envisioned universe uh, to life. And in this case, I'm just uh, briefly, I'm going to go over this. Uh, so initially, you just start to develop your own language in a way, your own semantic, and then you start in a way fine tuning models that uh, kind of uh, are able to learn now those semantics that you describe. And once you have that, the idea is like, can we now have these models that learn the semantic uh, universe that we described? Can we have that model that translate correctly um, into, a, into an architectural domain now? Uh, all that information. Yeah? So as you can see here, the data sets, the training, everything was a very abstract in a way, uh, um, language or syntax. And then this is translated coherently in architecture. Yeah? So here you just see a few of those results. And I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, so rather than following this kind of conventional approach of prompting generative AI models to create intricate variations of existing building design, my approach is centered around using generative AIs as a tool 
the CIS creatives in exploring and constructing their own unique language, style, and universe. And by establishing this kind of self-defined uh, framework, creative individuals are empowered to actively engage with and shape their creative domains, unlockly, uh, uh, unlocking endless possibilities for artistic uh, exploration and expression. And um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I'm just going to skip through. So my understanding is that the future is going to be uh, um, dominated by this kind of ecology of, ag of agents, AI agents. And I think for us, the question should be, uh, which are the rules of interaction between these agents and which are the rules of interaction between us as humans and those agents? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so we will go to our last speaker. Stanley, please. You can I'll fire up your presentation. And I need to share the screen as well. Whoops. Sorry. OK. Yeah, ready? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. OK, this is the most fancy part of my presentation because I'm a writer. So um, thanks for having me here. Um, so st I visited uh, Dafu's uh, exhibition yesterday. It was so fascinating. And um, I can see this is perhaps the best AI generated, or maybe not AI, AI human generated uh, artwork I ever seen. And it's so sophisticated and well uh, articulated. And I think from my own perspective, I started to use a language model, even that large back in the 2017. And I worked with my ex colleagues uh, from Google. So we built up a language model, use CNN, uh, convolutionary uh, neural network and STM, long short term memory to build up a very simple preliminary uh, model. And all the data set was from my own writing uh, materials. So, and interestingly, um, because I signed up the contract with the City Press on um, 2017, and it's all about human AI co-evolution or co-existence. Uh, it's a collection of six short stories. So I'm thinking about why shouldn't I uh, use AI to co-author uh, something with me? So I build this uh, model with the engineers. And interestingly, 2019, so I got a call from, um, uh, from, China, uh, from Shanghai uh, Literature Association, and they asked me, do you use AI to uh, co-author with you in one piece of your short story called The State of Trance? I said, yes, why ask? because they use AI as a jury um, to giving an award. So they basically running score for over, I think 1000 something stories on uh, published on the previous year, 2018 on major Chinese literature magazines, those most famous ones. And interestingly, um, they found the Nobel Prize winner on literature, Mr. Mo Yan, was on the top of the list, right? There's nothing wrong about it. So they think the AI jury do the good job. But the final day of the submission, they got the final batch from the magazine. And surprisingly, my piece, my story, uh, top up the Mr. Moyen story and by I think 0 0.0001 and slightly win and it's so interesting because one AI may be written in a different language, different model, but somehow considering another story co-author with another AI, totally different AI, would be the best story among all of those most famous uh, established writers here. 
So this might be um, my lifetime experience. I can beat the Nobel Prize winner. So I can repeat this story like all my life. And, but it's much more like a science fictional moment. And I realized, okay, this is might be the tipping point of creative writing in the future. And I started to work with some other teams to upgrade our language model. For example, in 2020, we used uh, um, a, a team, we team up with some students to work on this AI science fiction world model is like um, um, equivalent to GPT-2 on the uh, level of parameters. And we invited more people, uh, more writers to join us and we, I can show you something between the different um, version of the model, then you can have a sense of its capacity of writing stuff and the style. And, you know, it's not very good at reasoning and it's not logical and there's no subjects, there's no characters. It's basically just prosing in a very poetic way. So I can see there's some, you know, very strange feeling on uh, aesthetically on the style. It seems like something from me, but it's not. So, and I can show you something afterwards. So this is, um, we call it like co-creation, the, the name of the project. And we invited more science fiction writer, even mainstream writers to join us. And we even put it on Zhihu. So have all this, you know, user to guess which part was from the AI, which part was from the human. And why I put this picture on the left, because it was back in the, you know, Macy's conference about cybernetics. So, you know, they, 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 they doing this very uh, spiritual ritual uh, to summon something from another dimension, but there comes the interdisciplinary collaboration and then comes the uh, burst of cybernetics. So I think we're doing the same thing here. We are not totally understand what is the fundamental me mechanism of the large language model here. It's just basically a black box and we don't understand what is emergence as well. So I'm talking to Anna, that's basically uh, very similar to Tao, you know, in Chinese ancient philosophy of Taoism, but is there is, real is existing and is changing us. So this is something from the next generation of our own view uh, large, uh, language model. So you can see all this sentence with underlines were from AI and it's getting much, much better. And of course, sometimes it um, confused with characters, relationship whatsoever, but you can see it's it's very close to the, you know, students essay from uh, elementary school. And, and yeah, so um, like in 2019, I co-authored with Dr. Kai Fu Li on this book, AI 2041. So we try to predict the future of uh, basically like Dr. Kai Fu Li, he's very confident about, okay, we can predict, okay, 20 years, that sounds more reasonable to me and is not too far, it's not too close. And we use 10 uh, short stories in the book and with this uh, tech essay to explain what's behind the scene, all these technologies and what is going on in the future. And somehow we found it when we try to predict the future in details, we always make it wrong. For example, there's one story in the book is talking about deep fake. We, we think there will be still be GAN, right? Because that was back in 2019. But when the book came out in 2021, 20, uh, just after a few couple of months, I, I, I think, shit, they're using diffusion model. And that's totally changed the game. And right now they have Pazong, uh, the new, the latest model is even more efficient. So I think we're doing it, um, when we try to capture the, all these te technological details, we always make it wrong. And another example is like we hire some human 
artists, illustrators from New York, uh, try to give some uh, visual artwork attached to some of the stories. It takes months to finish all this artwork because the human has to read the story, they have to understand it, and they have sent us some draft. We send them some feedback and back and forth communication, and it's very costly, no matter it's time or money. And after a while, so before this presentation, like Neil just said, I use Mid Journey within a minute. I generate all of those. And now I even use it to generate my own cover art for my books. And, and I think the publisher are also very happy because they don't have to pay for it. And they asked me, are there any copyright issue? I say, not in China yet. <laughs> and, and also I try to expand my you know, area, not only as a writer, but maybe as a movie maker. And I can show something here. It took me to- We thought we see everything. We thought we know everything. We were wrong. There is something beyond us. Something we couldn't imagine this summer. You will experience something worse than climate change, even war or terrorism. No one knows how to save the world except for one. Nerdy kid. Wait, what are you talking about? Someone wants to kill him. While someone wants to save him. When the end of the world arrives. Can we count on him? So cool. Never mind. Dragon Scales, coming soon. So, we Oops. guess um, how long it took me to finish this. Yep, two days. So from, from scratch, from learning all these tools, of course I can use Mid Journey, but I have to learn how to use runway and and all the music, all the score and all the voiceover were from AI generated. And but of course I I I I, I generated the the creative uh, creative part and and the idea. So you can see that it's not perfect. It's very sketchy. It's is inconsistent on the you know human face and also the body structure is kind of weird, but you can also see the potential here because it used to be the one team maybe a dozen of people they have to collaborate, and right now you can like be a single solo player then you can manipulate everything and you can have everything by your own. So it's a very powerful tool to you know, unlock the potential of each creator, especially those who rely heavily on language and text. So this is some tool I'm using right now. It's called PseudoWrite. So maybe some of you already tried it. It's from also a writer, James Yu. So it's very well fine tuning and design um, from a genre write, uh, fiction writing uh, perspective. Uh, for example, you can see all this part. I'm not doing the commercial here because he didn't pay me. And, but I, I really found it very interesting because he's a writer himself. So he designed the whole product from a very, you know, um, the creative process of writing something uh, from, from nothing. And you can see, I think the most interesting part is the latest um, feature story um, engine. So basically, I think 
he um, built a very um, um, infrastructural prompting system. So you can see this is the different phases of creating something as a, a fiction writing. So this brain dump, you can input like 1,500 words as a very basic or very random stuff as a word building character or plot lines whatsoever. And it can take you to the synopsis or maybe to the bits. So it all depends on the habits or the style of each writers uh, adapt to. And also you can like change the style or change the genre. Basically it, uh, it took seconds to make it happen. So I think it's very powerful not to use it to finish a whole book, but it's very useful when you have something in your head, but you know, writer's block is always, you want to make it perfect. You want to think through everything in details until you were convinced that you should put it down. So I think that that, that is the biggest block uh, in my head to stop me to being productive. So I think this is a very good thing because it's quick is like cost like nothing and it can generate something then you can have a like blueprints in hand and you can see oh this might work this might not work and you can change and you can erase it you can like do it all over again um, but you have something in your hand and that help you to get over get rid of this writer's block very easily so I think this is one of the most uh, psychological part, um, how to use AI to, to help me. And of course, there's many, many like methods here, modularization, layers, recurring iterations, and style as fine tuning and rapid brainstorming. But the most important thing is using GPT as an interface to reflect human interface because we're all using language to think to communicate, to express ourselves. So think about that. How can we fine tuning ourselves as a human being and to help us to be a better, you know, individually or like as a society? So I think the question here is not can machine be creative, but can human be more creative with the help of machine? And my answer is definitely yes. And I hope everyone here could try it by yourself and let us know what's the best outcome of it. So thank you. Okay, so we will try to hit the schedule and finish at 12.30. Um, and we will spend like one minute to set up here in the middle of the room, our panel, okay? Thank you. Okay. Hello. I would ask also our speakers, Niall and Daniel, if you can open your camera so that we can all see you. Thank you so much. Okay. Did I start? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I have so much, uh, I have so many questions and I realize we have a time shortage. So let me start by an observation that some of you may want to comment on, and then I'll sort of directly go into a question. And I think just because Zoom is kind of awkward, maybe we just answer in the order of the speakers um, so that we don't, you know, stumble over each other. Um, so I, I really um, appreciated so much the, um, the show and the work uh, for this emphasis on collaboration. Um, and I think that's particularly uh, important at the moment when so much of our response to AI or so much of the popular response to AI 
is um, has to do with anxiety, which Niall uh, uh, showed. And I think that in the speakers, there's kind of two forms of anxiety uh, or two maybe motivations of this anxiety. One is a sort of progressive evolutionism, this notion that something is coming that is better than us, that is like us, but is better than us, uh, what we saw with the Arthur C. Clarke quote. And the other type of anxiety, which was also mentioned, is this kind of realization when we work with these tools or when we encounter these tools, that maybe we're much more conventional, maybe we're much more robotic than we thought. And so those two types of anxiety are very much uh, in the air. And so I really appreciate this other uh, evolutionary model, actually, uh, which is symbiosis, right? To, to focus on symbiosis as opposed to some notion of progressive advance. So um, people might want to comment on that, but let me just pose, first of all, a question with that kind of in the background, maybe. Um, I think there were these two, um, this juxtaposition that I think many of us feel between a real kind of excitement and also anxiety about the emergence of an alien intelligence, something totally unknown and uh, totally amazing and totally exciting, uh, but also very scary. So that kind of um, sense of what's happening with AI. And uh, I think on the other hand, this uh, very familiar, uh, but as, as was said, invisible infrastructure that we encounter all the time, which is actually, um, we can use the Yen Lu Kun, uh, impressive but shallow, but also can be quite irritating and uh, annoying, you know? And so there's this juxtaposition of our kind of everyday encounter with the AI telephone prompter or whatever, and this sense of like this new alien uh, intelligence amongst us. And I was thinking as you were all speaking that maybe one way of like unlocking the latter rather than sort of being caught up in the former is through these new techniques uh, of, of the prompt and then others suggested other techniques coming off of the prompt. So I wonder if you could speak to that um, to your own, in your own experience, this way of maybe unlocking the more um, um, interesting aspects of AI rather than um, being like, as I frankly often am kind of frustrated by its limitations. So maybe we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the comment. Um, I will try very shortly uh, because I'm aware of the time and I want to leave some time for other speakers. But um, yes, it is certain that uh, AI is a disruptive medium. It has disrupted everything around us, right? Even in the university, we think about new ways on how we can adjust the usage of AI with the students' works or with our colleagues and, you know, um, it is, it is an issue, but um, I will reference here uh, Crawford Holling, uh, who is, um, uh, has done like studies uh, in ecological systems, right? How does ecological systems work when you have a predator emerging into the ecosystem? And usually what happens is that the ecosystem, yes, it will be disrupted in the beginning, but after a while, it will find a way to survive and evolve and it will co-evolve with this predator that kind of emerges into, um, into the space. Um, th this is one thing. Um, regarding the creative aspect, I believe that it is up to us on how we utilize AI, and the AI at the moment is just, um, in a way, a medium for us to convey our ideas and our thoughts. As I mentioned in one of my pieces earlier, I see this as a symbiotic system. And certainly we need to find a way to kind of live, 
together with this and find the way that we feel comfortable and we can utilize it for our benefit. And I will just jump into Niall's uh, previous comment about alien technology. And yeah, maybe I agree. Maybe we have alien technology, but we are part of that. So we are, in a sense, our aliens as well. Yeah. Someone to continue my thoughts? Leave your microphone open. Do you want me to comment? Um, yeah, please. No, I mean, just, I, I want to say that my view has evolved, you know. Um, actually, it was in Shanghai. I spent a summer in Shanghai. I spent 2019, I think it was. And after that, um, I was running on AI, but I felt compromised, a bit like Elon Musk. And think is amazing, but also terrifying. And I persuaded my publishers to um, produce two books rather than one. One with a white cover, like an angel, and one with a black cover, like a sort of Black Mirror episode thing. And that's the one I, I haven't written yet. And I was going to put it off because, you know, I wanted to write some positive things about AI. But frankly, it's kind of, it's becoming very clear to me that um, things are happening. And, you know, and I did take, used to take exactly the view that Daniel took in his presentation. And I think I've shifted in recent months, um, recent weeks, really, just by, by looking at, at, at uh, Jeff, people like Jeffrey Hinton and, uh, and, um, uh, and Mo Gadat Gad, Gad and Gad, how do you suppose it? G A W D A T, Mo Gad, Gaudat, you know, and others. And, and you know, I think that's that's one thing. And secondly, just from working on Mid Journey, I mean, I know that Mid Journey is just images and so on, and there are other things in the pipeline that will come online in two to three years' time that will be completely, will completely change how we operate. For sure, it's just, it's just images. <clears throat> but nonetheless, I am blown away by what you can do with Mid Journey right now. And it gives us a glimpse of the potential. So I think the idea that I used to hold to, that this is simply a prosthesis to the human imagination, that it's full of extended intelligence, that actually I'm not so certain about it at all. And I'm certainly not so sure about the um, some of the comments I made. Um, that Stanley was talking about how his books were out of, out of, out of date by the time it was published. My books also, right? They were also based on GANs. And now, you know, I'm now doing another edition uh, in English and also a Chinese version. It's going to all be um, diffusion models. <clears throat> so, I mean, there, there's, there's something new that's coming out there that is, that is just blowing me away. You know, if I can do, like, I could fill a fashion catwalk. I mean, Sally did a, a, a book in two days. I could fill a, fa a fashion catwalk in Paris in, in 10 minutes. I mean, this is something astonishing. And I think we've got to, move beyond into a different mindset because they're thinking things that are emerging and i think that's why emerging capability is such an interesting topic and at large language models we have completely ignored them in the realm of architecture but they are the things behind it if you ask most architects what they're doing or designers what ai is they'll say oh chat gpt or midget they're just the applications right we need to look at the the, the system itself the, the large language models to really understand it so i think that the, the goalposts are shifting you know I, I did follow much of what was said today myself a few months ago, but my perspective is, is radically changing. And I'm kind of excited, but terrified. I mean, just to say the dark side of AI, there's nothing evil about AI. It's a tool, right? It's like, but a tool, if you use a tool in the wrong way, a kitchen knife could be a murder weapon, you could also use it to chop up your vegetables. It's just a tool. And it's a question of who is using the tool. Um, really, that's the important thing. But the tool itself is just blowing me away blowing me away. Excellent. We all want to be excited and terrified. <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, so from my side, like probably, probably I have similar views like Neil. It's just that I'm coming from the side of uh, developing the AI tools. And um, for me, it's always this kind of crusade of uh, how, how do we uh, involve the entire profession to start to develop their own tools, you know, yeah. Because right now we are just relying on the yes, ChatGPT, Mid Journey, and all that, and we can in a way uh, have this kind of reaction how amazing to those tools are, but we know that those are not really tools that are really uh, tailored for our industry. So for me, it's always this kind of challenge of let's do our own tools. Yeah, we don't have to be afraid of it. Uh, we can develop the tools in a way that really benefits us as uh, as humans, as designers, in a way. And I think uh, it's the same way, like, you know, we had CAD. 
So how did CAD impact architecture? Suddenly it started to elevate architecture to a certain level. And suddenly we had computation and computational design suddenly allowed us to think about architecture and about cities in a complete different way. Yeah? It's almost like we, we, uh, we graduated to a new level of thinking about architecture. And I see the same thing also with AI. But I think if we are just uh, giving into the fear of you know, uh, big language models or so on, we are going to actually be distracted from this, uh, this task of let's figure out what this new chapter is, you know, for us creatives, you know, I am. Um, and personally, I, I don't subscribe in a way with a lot of things from um, um, Jeffrey Hinton, for example. I know that he's a godfather of something. Also, Jan Lecuri is the godfather of something else, you know. But for me, it's just this kind of understanding of, you know, like um, if you put a kid in a box an entire life, and you just feed him text, you cannot expect that that uh, kid will learn what a car is, for example, yeah? So you cannot drive a car just because you read it, because you have no concepts of what the car is, you know? So just through text, you cannot really uh, understand things, yeah? So that's why for me, it's a bit dubious, like, you know, uh, uh, his claim. And that's why I'm more on uh, Jan Le Kuhn's, you know, a camp, because I understand in a way this, you need multimodality in a way to understand the surrounding world. You cannot rely just on one modality alone and then uh, and then uh, develop an understanding, yeah? Uh, so I know also people that, let's say, are blind. It's a different kind of mechanism, but they still have different stimuli in a way that they use or different sensors that they use to experience the world. But it's not just one modality alone, yeah? So that's for that's why for me it's a bit dubious, you know, this kind of claim of, uh, you know, emergence. Because, like, yes, emergence, you can have emergence in anything, uh, but can you explain it? You just, uh, how, how do you describe emergence as something unfamiliar or how do you describe it, you know? So then um, is that effect that is resulting from language models, is that something actually meaningful, relevant, or is it just something that is unfamiliar to us and we, we find it interesting, you know? Look, Dana, can I just to say one thing? I think there's a danger of over valorizing the human contribution. I mean, there's one of the comments that Stephen Wolfram makes in his book about ChatGPT is actually ChatGPT, which is basically just predicting the next word in the sentence. That's all it's doing. And it's, it's, it's hard. It's basically showing us that the that, that writing is not, it's not so, it's much more straightforward than we thought it was. And maybe human writing wasn't so sophisticated. No? Um, and I always also suspect that maybe design itself wasn't so sophisticated. We're just borrowing upon a few contextualized examples in precisely the same way that Mid Journey is doing. So that, that's what I've got. The other comment I would make is, is the real challenge really with these things. I mean, it goes back to the AlphaGo thing. Is kind of we don't know what's going on half the time. You know, when AlphaGo is making move 37 game two, we, we can't even get, get our heads around it. It's operating at a different sort of level. So we've got to be very careful of making all these claims about it and what it can or cannot do because it seems to me it's operating at a level way beyond us. And I always use the example of the comparison of human beings and dogs. Dogs can smell and hear a much greater range of smells and, and sounds than we can. My suspicion is what's happening in, in AI is it's operating at a different level of intelligence that's way, way beyond us. The dumb, they say, don't know how dumb they are. And I think we're relatively dumb compared to these, these machines. So I, 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 my, my thinking is evolving. Can I have a feedback there? Um, so personally, I will not put an uh, equal sign between writing and designing because there are so many uh, systems involved. For example, you can easily generate an image uh, in mid-journey that resembles Zaha architecture, but that doesn't mean it's a Zaha building. Because Zaha building has many, many other like uh, aspects behind it to end up being a Zaha building. But those aspects cannot be encoded just in an image, for example. Yeah. So you cannot carry uh, in that image all that information that describes a project, for example. Yeah. So that's why you need multimodality. With text, it's a completely different story. It's just one modality. Writing is just one modality. Designing is not one modality, you know. Maybe for certain industries, like for example, um, graphical, like you know, you uh, design posters and so on. That's one type of industry, and Mid Journey is perfect for those kind of industries. But if we talk about urban, if we talk about architecture, construction industry, and so on, you cannot rely on one modality and uh, believe that an AI through one modality is going to figure out a building, because there are many things that are not documented into a building, you know, through text or images. 
So how are you going to uh, account for those, you know, in your AI model, you know? So, okay. And let's, let's do, you want to, uh, do you want to speak in defense of writing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, even like writing in, on text is not like single modality, I think. So because we're using our uh, sensory uh, system, everything like touch, smell, even memories, embodied experiences, for example. I think one thing is, it feels so fascinating when I using AI is like you treat it just like unintentionally like towards a human you try to talk nicely you try to you know uh, try to set up the persona like the professionality you are a world-class writer right you 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 are very uh, empathetic you are you are you are descriptive you are very you know you know uh, resonated or whatsoever so it feels like it can help the AI to generate something better, but also it re reflecting to us, you are making us a better human being because we try to treating each other better, you know, in a better manner. So I'm thinking about that always, like um, if this is some alien technology and why, why not? Because recently one one of my favorite quote was from Ursula Le Guin. He, she said like, the future is already full. It's much older and larger than our present, and we are all aliens in it. So it's very deep and it is very Taoism. So think about it. And I think another thing is why we so eager to build up something to think like human. I think this is a very good question to be asked. I think uh, from Jeffrey uh, Hinton, he said like, we, we couldn't fully understand something until we build it, right? So he think that's the fundamental uh, imposition of, of why we want to build some thinking machine. So this is a very fundamental question to all of us. Um, I, I just wanted to make one short comment. And maybe we can have time for one more question. Um, and I wanted to uh, highlight that uh, uh, we, we are kind of confronted with another issue as well, that uh, humans might kind of impact the creativity in the machine. Um, if you have seen studies about autophagy, autophagy, right? That you feed in like wrong results into the uh, data set, and then you have an um, uh, outcome that it's not as good as before. The same thing with like Mid Journey, if we continue training with synthetic images or images that they don't kind of uh, highlight the aesthetics or the qualities that uh, we would like, then we will have a kind of an impaired machine creativity that it's kind of impacted by the human behavior, right? Okay. Um, Stavros says one more question, but I have two more, so I'm going to fold them in together and then you guys can choose which you want to answer or speak to. Uh, one thing is I kind of wanted to talk about cities. Um, I'm very interested in cities and I think that the questions that urbanists think about or have been thinking about a long time are very similar to these questions about AI to do with this dichotomy between a kind of top down control and a bottom-up uh, emergence, let's say. Um, so there was talk of an ecology of AIs versus uh, uh, a kind of top-down control AI. Um, I think that given the experience that especially here we've all had with COVID and the control systems that you know, uh, that were in place by City Brain, um, you know, things like that. Uh, that we've experienced in a way this, this mode of a kind of top-down control, but we also can understand very well that there's these kind of ecology of sentience uh, emerging around us. So that dichotomy, I think, is very important both in our thinking about AI and in our thinking about cities. So that's one. And But I also just wanted to, this is a kind of add-on, so... Um, I just wanted to say as a last thing that I was really struck by what Stavros said at the end of his talk about how photography, uh, um, one of the results of photography is abstract expressionism and abstract painting. Um, and, and this is something, of course, that is very well known from the AlphaGo game 
where uh, the the way apparently people now play Go has changed because of the way that the machine showed us how we all play. And so I'm curious whether anyone's uh, experienced hints of some other medium or some other, you know, sort of unexpected thing that's that's come out that is uh, analogous to say this photography and abstract painting kind of um, example that Stavros gave. So either that or this question about control and, and bottom-up emergence. Do you want to start? Um, I will start with the tools. Yes, certainly there are like a lot of um, different um, methodologies that we utilize in the creative production um, if, we, if we work with media. Uh, but uh, I, I can I can totally say that the the practice will not change. It will be kind of integrated, right? Um, uh, b before you mentioned about having the cover of your um, uh, book, and uh, you know many graphics that I also designed for this exhibition, I still needed a graphic designer, right? But still, you have a kind of a larger pool of selections, and it kind of helps better to highlight and select what it kind of you want. Right. So the I think the, the, the creative process is much more efficient, but uh, still like the people will be in their places, they, they will do their, their jobs. I don't think it will be affected in any way. The creative production process, the workflow will be the same, but there will be like some different things here and there that they will integrate the artificial uh, intelligence and all of the generative uh, media. Yeah, I stop here. OK. Uh, yes, Inal, that you're muted. Me? Yeah. Oh. Yes. yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to say that I think, you know, in the end, um, I what I find really intriguing about it, I'm a, I'm a theorist by back my training, I was working on kind of philosophy for some time and so on, but I think really what is going to be interesting is how what it's going to tell us about ourselves, how it becomes a mirror in which we can understand ourselves. And it seems like what is so interesting right now, which is not something we touched upon today, but you know, I think it's fascinating, is how there's a kind of confluence between the world of neuroscience and the world of AI, where you get people like Dennis Osadis who've done PhDs in, in, um, in, in neuroscience and people like um, um, uh, Anil Seth, who's done a PhD in, in AI and moves into neuroscience. There is an incredible moment when we're kind of getting this it's a kind of perfect storm of these individuals coming together. Plus, not only academia, but also the world of practice. I mean, Demis Mercedes is in practice. You know, Blazer Veriakis is in back practice. But there's, a, there's an astonishing moment. And I think that that is the, the key thing. And I, I, you know, we can both, in terms of the mirror of AI, I think we can both see the differences between us and then AI, but also at some point begin to maybe unpack things that we never thought about ourselves at the beginning to come forward. And I, personally think that we need to kind of challenge this idea that the human being is so creative. I think that is an absolute myth. I didn't touch on it today, but I think we operate within a canon of what is architectural. We kind of follow a little bit like Zaha, a little bit like Ren Corliss, a little bit like whatever, you know? And you even get sort of the, the progressives like Frank Gehry copying himself, for goodness sake. So I think we can, we can use it as a way to probe things and challenge things. And um, uh, so I, I find it absolutely fascinating. I think it's the, one of the most astonishing moments that I would compare to when I began my career back in the 90s when we had sort of, you know, deconstruction and Derrida and whatever else and, and the computer and so on. Now we're into something astonishing. I think that Wolf Pricks talks about from decon to AI. I think we're in a moment of really astonishing uh, uh, generation of ideas and things. It's an amazing moment. Excellent. Oh, can I add something? Yes, please yeah, I think I agree, I agree with Neil. I think... Um, I think we are still right now with AI, we are in that phase where photography was like uh, just mimicking paintings in a way. Uh, so we still have to find in a way, which is that new new expression, a way, new new way of uh, thinking and working. Yeah? And um, I'm also like threading this kind of fine line because I agree with Neil, like, yes, sometimes we think that as humans, we are very creative, but we, we tend on falling in this kind of very familiar patterns and we keep repeating the same things in a way. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm really curious and excited actually about the future uh, to see where AI can take us, you know, AI. So that's why personally I'm coming from the optimist part of things. I'm not so scared of AI because I'm just embracing it and I'm just looking 
where we are going to go from here, you know, uh, what, what what we are going to discover, you know, what kind of new creativity we are going to discover, you know, maybe it's not the what we think that creativity is, maybe it's something else, you know. Want to add something? Yeah, I, I mean, like this kind of like paradigm shift, I think it's not only on aesthetic, but also epistemology and also ontology. So I think because before that, we always have this kind of metaphor like life is like whatsoever drama, movie, game, simulation. Like right now, we might think life is a model. So if you think like we're basically like GPT, but more than language model, but we're like a multimodal model, right? But think about that where just one of the many models like human right we're, we're nothing like prior than any other models so we need more of these human-centric data set be put in this you know like computation process to make it a whole integral model so i'm thinking about maybe this is towards the ultimate goal of life and consciousness is to become oneness with the cosmos Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Niall. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.